This week on The Record, Republican voters want solutions at the southern border. But do Republicans in office? Senator Eric Schmidt is on the record. Voters rank the economy their second most important issue. Even as data shows, it's improving. Why don't voters feel it? Congresswoman Nikki Budzinski is on the record. Governor Mike Parson delivers his state of the state. And what's at stake when politicians put the pursuit of power over the exercise of it? We check the record. It's all coming up right now. Welcome to The Record, I'm Mark Maxwell. American allies in Ukraine want Congress to come to their aid in their fight for survival against Vladimir Putin's Russian invasion. But before Congress acts, Republicans say Democrats must address their top priority. Border, border, border. We have to take care of our own house. We have to secure our own border. Speaker Mike Johnson earlier this month, he traveled to Eagle Pass, Texas and highlighted the urgency of Congress passing something soon. If President Biden wants a supplemental spending bill focused on national security, it better begin by defending America's national security. The longer we wait, the longer we delay the closure and securing of this border, the greater the crisis and the problem. We have been working in earnest and in good faith with the Senate and the White House virtually every day through the holiday trying to come to an agreement. Negotiations are still ongoing. It's drug on way too long. Ten days ago, President Biden met with the Speaker and Republican leaders in Congress to negotiate a deal. Uh, The President was very forthright. I told the President what I have been saying for many months, and that is that we must have change at the border, substantive policy change. But we must insist, we must insist that the border be the top priority. I, I think we have some consensus around that table. Everyone understands the urgency of that, and we're going to continue to press for it. He wants substantive policy change, so let's dig into that substance. Missouri Senator Eric Schmidt is on the record. Thanks for joining us. We just heard from caucus goers in Iowa and Republican voters in New Hampshire. Immigration is far and away their top issue, followed by the economy, but immigration came in number one in both places. You said on social media that a president, quote, doesn't need new legislation to secure the border. I just want to be clear for our viewers. Are you saying there's nothing you can do to improve border security? No, what I'm saying is if Joe Biden was interested in securing the border, he could do it right now, but he's not. And I'll give you two examples. Remain in Mexico was working under President Trump and made Mexico the waiting room for asylum claim seekers and nine out of 10 are bogus. He got rid of that. People are just, it's a catch and release. They they release them into the interior of the United States. And he's also abusing the parole process, which is supposed to be individual adjudications. He's releasing people into the country. We don't know where they're at. We don't know who they are because they come from a certain country or some other category. That's illegal. And that accounts for millions of people coming here across the border illegally. So if he did those two things, we'd have a secure border. He doesn't need any new language for that. But the problem is we have an administration that's hell-bent on open borders. That's the truth. It's an ugly truth, but it's a fact. And so that's why we're dealing with the problems we're dealing with. But you are open to doing something and improving the legislation that does exist. Well, he doesn't need additional authorization. That's my point. And it's hard to judge that when we haven't been, we haven't seen it. It's all been secret backroom dealings so far. So it's hard to comment on language no one's seen. The problem is we have a president who is captured by the extreme left, who believes that they're citizens of the world, not Americans, and therefore everyone's entitled to come here and get benefits for free. That's the truth. That's the problem. And until that changes, nothing's going to change at the border. And we've pressed governors like Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker on some of those very questions about benefits for migrants and undocumented workers, even on this program just last week. So certainly an interesting discussion going on in Congress right now. But in other unrelated topics or areas, you've argued that executive branches or executives have too often exceeded their power and should be restrained by the legislature. So that's why I wanted to see if we can focus on what you think you can do to improve the situation. We don't need any language changes. We don't need him to expand his executive authority beyond what the statutes already um, call for. And so that's why, again, I think we're you know, kind of running in circles with this thing. If Joe Biden was committed to this process of securing the southern border, he could do it today. He doesn't want to. And that's, again, why we have the problems we have. All right, let's see if we can explore things where maybe you see room for improvement in the statutes. Are you familiar with how hard it is to migrate here legally? Well, I don't know how hard it is. You have to you know, wait in line. And go by the, and by the way, some of the people who are most frustrated with this, you know, illegal immigration problem we have right now are people who've come here legally. So I certainly support 
legal immigration. I think it's a great thing. What I don't support is illegal immigration. And the other problem here too, Mark, is when you send this signal to the rest of the world that we have an open border, guess what happens? People follow those incentives, particularly the cartels. And so the cartels are driving these caravans essentially, you know, through Central America and through Mexico. Um, and that's why we have the problems we have. And by the way, they're using the same lanes for their drug trafficking for human trafficking. So anybody who wants to tell you that the situation we have right now at the southern border is somehow compassionate uh, denies the reality on the ground. There are women and children being abused along the way, rape and tortured, people being extorted. Um, so when you have, again, uh, this kind of chaos at the border because of lack of leadership, well, there's a lot of human suffering along the way. And we don't even have time in this interview to go through all the different questionnaires and steps you have to go through to get through that line and come here legally. It's a very extensive process. But uh, according to the Congressional Research Service, claims of asylum require the lowest standard of proof from undocumented migrants at the border. Do you see any evidence that maybe migrants could be claiming that asylum who don't necessarily qualify? And would you want to raise that standard of proof? No, I don't, I don't think we need to change necessarily. I think that we need to enforce it. The truth of two is, I don't know if it's in that study, Mark, but about nine out of 10 of those asylum claims essentially are bogus, right? But the cartels are training people what to say when they get to these, these ports of entry or in between ports of entry, but they're, they're being told to say these magic words. So you see real abuse of what actual asylum claims really are supposed to be. And there, there are real cases of people seeking asylum, but the, but the problem is, again, those are supposed to be individualized. Um, and I think this parole process in particular that people are starting to zero in on, which we've seen no language on if there's going to be any changes to this, this is essentially the escape hatch for the administration right now to say we're going to release you know, literally millions of people. That's not supposed to happen. You're supposed to have individual adjudications of these cases, whether on parole, and that's not happening right now. To be clear, it's the law that allows the executive branch to make that discretionary judgment call. The law could change to make it harder to claim asylum. Would you support that? Mark, what I'm telling you is those are supposed to be individualized adjudications. What he's saying is if you're from a certain country right now, you immediately get paroled into the United States. And again, we don't know who they are or where they're at. That's illegal. So if you, it's not even a loophole, that's just, it's a clear violation of the law. There's actually some legal challenges on that right now. But again, because this administration has been captured by the open borders crowd, people are just being released in mass. That's a violation of existing law. We don't need a new law for that. If you just followed the current law we'd have right now, you could really clamp down on a lot of the illegal immigration that's happening. All right, thanks for your time. All right. You might have noticed the senator's reluctance to pass a new law there. We talked to him early Wednesday morning. Within hours, the winds in Washington had shifted. John Bresnahan at Punchbowl News reported Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell told Republicans, quote, the politics of this have changed and we are in a quandary, McConnell said, because Trump is now the nominee in his words and, quote, we don't want to do anything to undermine him. I think the border is a very important issue for uh, Donald Trump uh, and the fact that he would communicate to uh, Republican senators and Congress people that he doesn't want us to solve the border problem because he wants to blame uh, Biden for it is, uh, is really appalling. But the, but the reality is that, that uh, we have a crisis at the border. The American people are suffering as a result of uh, what's happening at the border. Uh, and someone running for president ought to try and get the, uh, you know, the problem solved as opposed to saying, hey, save that problem. Don't solve it. Uh, let me take credit for solving it later. President Joe Biden promised to build an economy from the bottom up and the middle out. We asked Congresswoman Nikki Budzinski if he's keeping that promise next. Congresswoman Nikki Budzinski swore the oath of office to represent Central and Southern Illinois in Congress one year ago this month. She joins us now. Thanks for joining us, by the way. Thanks for having me, Mark. Your office wrote this five-page letter. We've got it here. It lists a whole number of things you've done in year one. Uh, wrote 15 bills, signed on to nearly 300 more, returned a bunch of calls and emails. Uh, pressed U.S. Steel to protect union workers, promoted infrastructure and agriculture. Did I get it all? And yeah. uh, voted to expand price controls for insulin beyond Medicare to all patients. We've been busy. Uh, a lot going on, but nothing in here about immigration. Well, immigration is obviously critically important. Uh, what we're seeing right now um, is a crisis at our southern border. This has been an issue that has been going on for quite some time. I believe that we need a bipartisan solution to address what's happening at the border, which means funding more border agents. It also means more technology at the border. We have a, thousands of illegal immigrants that are crossing our border today. This is a crisis that can't wait. Um, and I think it's something that demands a bipartisan solution. 
Uh, we'll get into some of that funding and tech in a minute, but President Biden is expanding drastically the definition and the exercise of the temporary allowance of parole to allow mm -hmm. people into the country. He says that's because it's often dangerous for migrants to have to stay in an immigrant jail quarters or mm -hmm. to stay at home in their country or some other country mm -hmm. along their journey. But Republicans say that kind of parole is really supposed to be limited to a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Is President Biden abusing his parole power? What I would say is we have a broken asylum system in this country, and that is just one part of the problem um, that demands a comprehensive uh, solution that, again, I believe that needs to be bipartisan, that allows for a pathway to legal status for folks that want to come in legally into this country, and some of those folks are seeking asylum. But I also think that we need to be securing our border. I think we should be able to do both of those things. And I think then this is exactly why I've actually signed on to a bipartisan piece of legislation called the Dignity Act that Republicans and Democrats in the House have come together around that would do just that. It would help to fix our broken asylum system. Also, like I said, create a legal pathway for folks that are looking for legal status. Um, but again, we need to be securing our border. And we need action on this right now, Mark. I don't think we can wait. Does it undermine the message of securing the border if the mm -hmm. president uses parole powers to admit that mm -hmm. many people, north of a million people? I think we need a comprehensive approach. I think the president, quite frankly, needs to be doing more at the border to secure it. Um, and I've been calling consistently for more resource, resources to reach the border to do just that. I think part of the problem that we've had is this piecemeal approach. Mm -hmm. um, we can't be doing a piecemeal approach. This, um, this is something that needs to be looked at holistically and from a bipartisan perspective, not one party, but both parties together to find a solution with the president. Polling from NBC News shows that the partisan divide between which party voters trust to deal mm -hmm. with immigration is wider than it's ever been before. Republicans mm -hmm. with an 18-point advantage mm -hmm. in that category. Why is that? I think that's really interesting because the news, and I would say some of my frustration out of Washington, is we're not seeing Republican leadership on this issue. I've signed on, as I said, to a piece of bipartisan legislation with Republican and Democratic colleagues to really fix our broken immigration system. But we have a Speaker of the House that has said publicly he'd rather use this issue of immigration reform as a political game as a as a place to score political points in this next year until the next election rather than solve what is a crisis right now on the border and sadly as you know mark this is some of the same um, information now that we're getting out of bipartisan conversations that have been happening in the senate have broken down and the senate um, republican leader mitch mcconnell has echoed what the republican house leader has said is let's continue to use this to score political points rather than address the crisis at the border and pass comprehensive immigration reform. And, and maybe you've heard it's a presidential mm -hmm. election year. Mm -hmm. uh, in 92 and 96, the conventional wisdom at the time was, I feel your pain and it's the economy stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, those, <laughs> just to borrow some phrases from James Carville and the Clinton campaign there. Um, the economy is roaring back. Yeah. Uh, the numbers that we see from the uh, Commerce Department and the, the federal government show that the GDP is up 3.3%, yeah. the American economy grew 2.5%, and President Biden's promoting that as saying, quote, wages, wealth, and employment are higher now than they were before the pandemic, during mm -hmm. the uninterrupted uh, Trump economy. Why aren't voters feeling that yet? I think that, first of all, that is incredible progress in our recovery coming out of COVID. The growth that we have seen in our economy should not be um, underscored, or it should be really emphasized that that is really positive progress. But what I do think is that working people at home are still struggling with the daily costs. We still have inflation that is much higher than what it was when we went into COVID. Mm -hmm. We also have things like a broken child care system where working families are struggling with the cost of child care, oftentimes costing as much as a mortgage or rent on a monthly basis. Um, we still have health care that is too high. You know, Democrats, when we had the House last Congress, were able to do common sense things like capping the cost of insulin for our seniors. I have co-sponsored legislation in the House to make that cap of insulin at $35 for everyone. We should be finding those kind of common sense measures to help people in their everyday lives keep more of what they earn. I think that will help relieve some of the pain points that people are still feeling in their everyday life. The unfortunate facts are that those people are not keeping more of what they earn. They're spending mm -hmm. more of what they earn mm -hmm. at the checkout or at the grocery mm -hmm. store or on their bills because we see that inflation uh, pay has not caught up with the speed of inflation. I want to ask you about this because yeah. President Biden will be on the ballot in 24, we think, mm -hmm. um, and, and you may be as well. He promised when he ran for this office yeah. that he'd build the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. Mm -hmm. 
if inflation is wiping out all these economic gains and that people in the middle class or at the lower rungs of the economy aren't really feeling it, mm -hmm. then is that a promise he kept? Well, I think it's something we need to continue to build on. I mean, one of the things that he was able to get done was the child tax credit. Unfortunately, the child tax credit, which was $300 back in the pockets of working families with children at home struggling to make ends meet, the same people you're talking about, Mark, he provided that relief and then it actually expired. There had been renewed talks in Washington about now taking back up the child tax credit to renew it. Um, I think those are the kind of things, and that's something that President Biden very much supports. I know a lot, a lot of my Democratic colleagues support, and I feel it like should be a priority. Those are the kind of things that we should be able to get done to help working people. Those are the things that President Biden very much believes on and we can be building on. We see the way the economy is trending, and barring mm -hmm. any unforeseen circumstances, bank rate research suggests that wage growth will eventually catch up with inflation by mm -hmm. the fourth quarter of 2024. Maybe you could think of something else happening in the fourth quarter of 2024. Mm -hmm. Won't it be too late by then for people to feel good enough to cast their vote? Because you know voters, you, we wouldn't deny that voters vote in yeah. favor of how the economy is doing. And, and I agree and I think that we need to be getting to the work of that right now. I would say some of the frustration that I've had in my first year in Washington is quite frankly the lack of leadership by this Republican House. Um, we've had two different speakers in one year. We're unable to get to a budget. We keep kicking the can down the road in these short-term spending uh, plans but can't get to a budget that would support working people. Um, and I think those are the things that we need to be doing and getting them off the table so we can get to the other issues that would support working people, middle class tax cuts. Congresswoman Nikki Budzinski, we're out of time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Governor Mike Parson starts his farewell tour, how his state of the state sets the stage for an election year budget brawl in Jefferson City. Missouri Governor Mike Parson delivered his final state of the state address in Jefferson City Wednesday. And with one and a half billion dollars in the bank, he said the state of the state is stronger than ever before. Our state is in a critical need of quality early learning programs. Increased teacher baseline pay to $40,000 per year. We are proposing an additional 3.2% cost of living increase for all of our state employees. Democrats endorsed those three ideas, but doubted much of Parsons' agenda could survive a splintered Senate where Republican leader Caleb Rowden just disciplined a number of rowdy members of the so-called Freedom Caucus. Taking away parking spaces from people who are having temper tantrums is not going to do any good. And in other news, Congresswoman Cori Bush officially kicked off her campaign bid for re-election to a third term this weekend. She faces a tough primary challenger this year, St. Louis County Prosecutor Wesley Bell. It's often easy to think current events are unprecedented, but we've almost always been there before. We wind back the clock more than half a century to check the record next. He was the last person Republicans nominated to be president before Donald Trump. Mitt Romney said it's appalling that Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell would conspire to stall on solutions at the southern border, solutions that might alleviate what Romney called the suffering of the American people until after the November election. So let's check the record. This would hardly be the first time a candidate seeking the powers of the Oval Office had tried to sabotage solutions and prolong conflict to gain political advantage. Secret White House tapes and communications cables declassified in 2008 show us that 40 years prior, back in 1968, as President Lyndon Johnson was closing in on reaching a peace deal in Vietnam in the Paris peace talks, then former Vice President Richard Nixon dispatched an aide to establish secret back channels with the South Vietnamese. He wasn't president. He wasn't commander in chief. In fact, President Johnson had already negotiated and was prepared to halt the bombardment of North Vietnam. Nixon told his advisor, H.R. Haldeman, if there was, quote, any other way, we can monkey wrench it. Then Nixon's aide told the ambassador to South Vietnam to pull out of that peace deal and, quote, just hang on through the election. The peace deal was off. President Johnson was furious. He considered going public for a while and blasting Nixon for treason, but feared backlash for spying on his political opponent and an ally in Asia. Nixon won the GOP nomination. It worked. Then he campaigned and criticized the White House for its inability to get the South Vietnamese to the table for those peace talks, the same table he pulled them away from. He won, then increased the bombing and spread the conflict from Vietnam into Laos and Cambodia. 
The cost of his conspiracy was ultimately marked in flag-draped coffins. By the time the troops came home, another 22,000 American soldiers had died. One test of a politician is whether they gain power to use it or just to keep more of it for themselves. Richard Nixon sacrificed peace on the altar of power. President Johnson called it treason. Maybe today's politicians would call something so egregious, I don't know, election interference. In the end, the record speaks for itself. And as those anti-war protesters shouted outside the DNC back in 1968, the whole world is watching. Thank you for watching. Until next week, we're off the record.